we will talk about cardiac mri in this series we'll be going through these topics one by one first coming to thickness of the myocardium so first of all this is how thickness should be measured in short axis and in diastole when we take these oblique sections of the myocardium of the left ventricle then we get these four chamber long axis view now if you see here if you measure the thickness here then these thickness in all these slices is not equal so that's why this is not a very correct method so better to measure in short axis view normal lv wall thickness is around 7 to 15 mm in children above 12 mm is thickened and it can be thickened in these conditions like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy aortic stenosis or amyloidosis below 6 mm is called thin or non viable myocardium for right ventricle normal rv wall thickness should be up to 7 7 mm and this can be thickened in again hcm or pulmonary hypertension or pul pulmonary stenosis interatrial septum can be measured in four chamber and should be up to 4 mm normally here is a detailed anatomy of the septum now coming to volumetry so for this we need to draw roi or region of interests over the endocardial and the epicardial surface of the lv wall the papillary muscles should be excluded to avoid overestimation of the lv mass when you draw the rois then you need to draw rois on each segment and if you are using singo then these are the tools using which you have to draw the rois and then you get a graph like this which gives you the end diastolic volume the end systolic volume the ejection fraction and the myocardial mass for the right ventricle we usually draw roi on the four chamber view but sometimes when rv walls are thick and then it can also be drawn in short axis just like the lv and if you draw epicardial roi then you can also get rv mass now let's see how to assess the wall motion or cine images first of all you should arrange all the images in a sequence like this so that you are going from the base once you start seeing the papillary muscles that is your mid cavity so we have the base mid cavity and the apical cavity and then the last section will be the apex now there are basically two methods one you can keep your cursor in the middle and then you can see how close each segment is coming towards your cursor so if there is any wall motion abnormality then that segment won't come as near to the cursor as the other segments or what you can do is look for change in thickness of the myocardium in diastole it will reduce and as it contracts the thickness should in increase something like this here in diastole it is thin and as it contracts it becomes thicker now coming to t2 stir images so just like any other part of the body stir is mainly used to look for edema here in cardiac mri stir images look like this these are tirm or ipat images black blood imaging now it has certain applications like it can differentiate acute versus chronic mi you can look for myocarditis or transplant rejection even in sarcoidosis there can be patchy myocardial edema let's look at this example we have this late gadolinium enhancement image 
and it shows two areas of enhancement here and here so these could be infarcts or some kind of scar now on corresponding stir image we have edema only here so now we can conclude that this is an acute infarct and this is a chronic infarct so this is one of the applications of stir images in cardiac mri this is a case of myocarditis you can see so much of edema in the lateral wall of the left ventricle now these conventional t2 images have certain drawbacks right like uh, the spatial resolution is not that good and it is very much prone to motion artifacts and it has a subjective interpretation like the data is not quantified so to quantify this data t2 data we do t2 mapping which we'll talk about next this is a t2 mapping image you should remember that t2 and t1 mapping values can differ on different machines like based on different field strength and different parameters which are used so normal can differ on different different machines here at our institute we take a normal t2 value of up to 40 now coming to basics of t1 mapping if you have read physics so far then you should know that if a substance has a low t1 value or a low t1 relaxation time then it will be hyper intense on t1 images like very few products like fat melanin blood products or proteinaceous contents then most of the pathologies in the body are t2 hyper intense and t1 hypo intense meaning they have a high t1 value or a high t1 relaxation time like edema fibrosis these things will be having a high t1 value now look at some examples so these things like edema collagen deposition or fibrosis which can occur in mi acute and chronic mi then deposition diseases like amyloidosis all these things will have a high t1 value and in very few conditions like fat deposition fabris in which uh, sphingolipid deposition occurs there will be decreased t1 value and because of iron overload because of susceptibility there will be low t1 value this chart this chart we can see here this is the normal ecv and t1 as you can see most of the pathologies are showing higher t1 values except for fabries iron deposition and lipomatous metaplasia now as i told you about t2 mapping similarly t1 mapping also depends on many factors like the field strength and various parameters which are used then there's also one more thing that native t1 value it cannot differentiate between various compartments of the myocardium like intracellular extracellular spaces it cannot differentiate where the pathology is coming from so in a way it's more sensitive but less specific now the two most important things which determine an increase in native t1 value are edema and an increase of the interstitial space i want to talk about the three compartments of the myocardium basically there are three compartments intravascular interstitial space and the intracellular space these two intravascular and interstitial these two form the extracellular volume here the same thing is shown again we have the intravascular interstitial and the intracellular compartment now as you see here the signal for native t1 value it comes from the entire thing it does not differentiate between the various compartments so in a way it makes it more sensitive also this is a post contrast t1 mapping image here i want to show you that gadolinium gets deposited in the interstitium and in the damaged cells or scar tissue or fibrosis so signal for post contrast t1 mapping it comes from these places the interstitium and the scar tissue 
So this is how fibrosis occurs. Uh, this fibrosis happens in the interstitial space. And when we give contrast, gadolinium is deposited in the interstitial space or in this fibrosis. So such diffuse interstitial fibrosis will cause expansion of the ECV as we are seeing here. Then it occurs in certain cardiomyopathies or amyloid de deposition. Let's look at this example. This is a LG image, late gadolinium enhancement. And we are not seeing much enhancement here, but on histopath, there is so much of fibrosis. So sometimes when diffuse fibrosis like this occurs, the enhancement might not be so much. Suppose there is very subtle enhancement. So we won't be sure whether this is enhancing or not. Then in such conditions, if we do T1 mapping, then mapping values will be high here. Here are certain examples. We will see what happens to the T1 mapping, T2 mapping and ECV in all of these cases. In normal, everything is normal. When there will be lipid or iron deposition, T1 will be low and T2 and ECV will be normal. When there is edema, edema causes T2 hyperintensity, so high T2 and high T1 because it is hypointense on T1. So high T1, high T2, high slightly raised ECV in edema, which occurs in normal, like acute MI. So in acute MI also we have high T2, high T1 and slightly raised ECV. But fibrosis, it occurs in the interstitial compartment. So in scar tissue or fibrosis, we have slightly raised T1, but a very high, relatively very high ECV and normal T2 since there is no edema. So T2 well will, will be normal here. Here same thing is shown that gadolinium is deposited in the interstitium. You can refer to this article if you want to read more. Now coming to myocardial perfusion. Now this is how perfusion images look like, obtained as flash moco or motion corrected images in our system. First the contrast enters the right ventricle, then the left ventricle, then the entire myocardium enhances. Now in these images you should look out for any non-enhancing areas like this. Now this could be a scar or an infarct. Now when we take LG image, there is some enhancement here so this again is suggestive of an infarct or a scar. Here we can see correlation of uh, perfusion with spect and angiogram. You can see some non-enhancing area here. So it shows a less uptake on spect and there is stenosis in, in the angiogram in that vascular territory. Same thing is shown in the form of a graph. This black graph is the abnormal segment. So it is taking up less contrast on perfusion as compared to the normal segment which is enhancing. Now one of the main applications of perfusion is to detect inducible ischemia or to perform stress perfusion. Now see what is happening here. At rest, this is a plain scan. At rest, the entire myocardium is enhancing. So if we don't do stress, we can think that this myocardium is normal. but once we induce stress or inject adenosine and perform and afterwards we perform perfusion then there will be some non-enhancing region so this non-enhancing area which appeared after inducing stress this is called as inducible ischemia this is the myocardium which is prone to infarct if there is a lot of exertion then this can go into infarct Now we'll talk about late gadolinium enhancement or LGE images. Now these are the late gadolinium enhancement or LGE images. These are PSIR or phase sensitive inversion recovery sequences. Inversion recovery means here we null the myocardium. So normally the entire myocardium should be nulled out. But if there is any gadolinium deposition that should 
uh, not be nullified and it appears as enhancement so the main concept that we should remember is that normal myocardium shows rapid washout of gadolinium and if there is any fibrosis or amyloid deposition then that will retain contrast so any fibrosis or any scar will show lge now let's look at the normal enhancement pattern of the myocardium so this is the plain scan we have the inter the intravascular the interstitial and the intracellular compartment then we give contrast and everything enhances so this is like your perfusion image uh, everything is the entire myocardium should enhance normally and on late gadolinium normal myocardium it washes out the contrast so there is no enhancement normally now here we have dam damaged myocardium so immediately after contrast everything is enhancing except the damaged part so this is just like a perfusion image this is the non enhancing area then that same damaged part will retain contrast and will be seen as enhancement on lge now in this case there is this diffuse fibrosis which is causing expansion of the ecv now when we give contrast in this then gadolinium will be deposited in the fibrosis or in the interstitium so there will be diffuse late, late gadolinium enhancement can be seen as can either be patchy or diffuse enhancement now if we take t1 mapping value here then t1 will be raised and ecv will also be raised 